Welcome everybody to Explain. We're um, with my good friend here, Stephen Boyce. We're going to talk today about a story of deconstruction. I was just talking to Stephen about this, and actually this has come into our conversation quite a bit because it just seems that this is happening more and more. Um, before we get into the story, we do want to just say that deconstruction in and of itself is really not necessarily a bad thing. Um, obviously, depending on what you deconstruct, um, what you are deconstructing and how far you take it, um, there's there's nothing wrong with um, challenging the status quo, kind of an examining why you believe what you believe. Um, those things are actually really important for faith and discussions of faith. But we've also seen it go way too far, and it seems to be a epidemic among people who are just uh, seemingly uh, departing from the faith, deconstructing. Um, and so we want to have a conversation about that. And we really do believe that we need to have more conversations and we need to have more conversations prior to, I feel like some of these people who do deconstruct, it's like they come out and they say, I'm no longer a Christian. I wonder if they had space to have these sort of conversations. Like they felt comfortable with sharing, Hey, I'm struggling with my faith. I'm, I'm struggling. Maybe it's an intellectual reason, an emotional reason, whatever it is. But to be able to freely communicate that, I think the church needs to get to a place where we can freely discuss these sorts of things. Stephen, you want to weigh in on that and share some thoughts about deconstruction? Yeah, we, we're actually a ministry that encourages questioning. Um, I Just to be upfront, we're fine with people asking the hard questions, too, not just ones that are surface level. Um, I think the problem is similar to what you were just saying, John, is we come to a place in churches where questions are not invited, including the difficult ones or ones that may, as a pastor and you've pastored, I've pastored, you get asked questions like, are we actually sure God exists? You know, you're immediately like, whoa, whoa, where's this coming from? Like, what kind of question is that? That doesn't belong in church kind of mentality. But actually, I think that's the best place for that question to be, because I think the problem with deconstructionism, John, is as one, somebody hits it in a critical state where they're mad, angry, embittered, or at a loss of looking for answers. When they hit that mode of questioning, that the types of questions they ask are almost already their mind is made up. But if they're in a place of sincere, like, man, I'm just not sure what to think about this or how come this happens. And the quick answers are, we just don't know, or just trust God or, and we're, we'll talk more about that sh in the show, I'm sure. But when that is our reaction, I think that breeds an embittered deconstructionism later. So I think there's two levels to deconstructionism. I think there's a healthy level where it's okay to ask questions because you just want to know. Then it hits that unhealthy level where it's like, everything's wrong. I'm questioning everything from top to bottom. Even if there is a good answer, I'm going to give it a negative connotation to start. And it's got a negative starting point because I'm just mad. You know, I think that's yeah. where a lot of these situations have gone. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of getting the phone call or the email or the text message from friends that we know who are telling us that they no longer believe in God anymore, or they're not even sure God exists anymore, or the Bible isn't the word of God or, or something along those lines. Like, man, is there right. a week that goes by? Right. We don't get that message. It's crazy. Yeah. I, yeah. I was just talking today, messaging with messaging somebody today. He was just, um, just actually expressing gratitude to have a space where they can communicate. Uh, those sort of things. And so if you are listening into this and you're like, you're interested in this conversation because you maybe feel like you're on the verge of deconstructing yourself, um, we would love to talk with you and to walk through with you whatever struggle that you're having. You know, if Stephen and I were honest, we have all been at that that point. I know Stephen and I have talked through many conversations where we've struggled with different things, sometimes an intellectual struggle or an emotional struggle as it relates to belief in God. And I know for myself, just being able to talk it out, um, I've always come out stronger in my faith rather than weaker in my faith. And so we want to invite that. Today, we want to talk about a story of deconstruction. And the guy's name, um, you may know his name. He's the uh, founder and producer of the Preacher Boy podcast, Eric uh, and I, I'm actually not going to say his last name. You know who I who it is. I, I practiced it, but sorry, Eric. 
I'm not going to try to butcher it too bad on online here. But um, I know Eric a little bit. We um, we're basically in the same type of circle of friends and ministry friends. And um, I have actually profited a lot from his podcast. One of the things that he's really tried to do is to to show where there is corruption, particularly in the independent fundamental Baptist movement. And I don't think that he's just trying to hate on everybody in that movement, but just trying to show where there is abuse, where there is corruption. And um, I think it is extended even past to other movements that have corruption. And I, man, he's, he's told some stories and I've just been hurting so much in my heart. There is so much um, that needs to change in the church that we need to respond to in a biblical way. And I do appreciate his work. And I also want to just say that I really do appreciate his um, his courage to to share where he is. Now, I don't agree with his conclusions, um, but I would say that I'm, I'm encouraged that he would to be able to, to get online and say, hey, this is where I this is where I stand. And if you watch the podcast that he released, and I think we'll have this in the, the, the a link below on YouTube or something like that. He did a podcast called Why I'm No Longer a Christian. And um, again, I just was blown away by his calmness and um, his clarity on what his struggle was and why he's no longer a Christian. So I'm thankful for his courage. And um, yeah, we want to take what he said in that video. We want to just take it apart and kind of deconstruct his deconstruction and um, help us to think through this. And hey, I also want to say, Eric, if you watch this video, um, we would love to have a conversation with you about some of these things. There's no doubt that we might not get it all right, or um, we may have misunderstood some of the things that you said. So by all means, feel free to reach out and offer some critique of uh, what we're going to, to share your way as well. But again, I just want to thank you for just being very open about where you're at. So basically his story, if you watch it, um, Eric shares a story that in high school, he was, he was a devout independent Baptist and um, he wasn't the type of person that was looking to kind of leave the movement. He actually really loved it. And he was as he put it, devoted to Jesus, reading his Bible, having his devotions, being at church, being faithful. Um, but what happened in his church was there was a sexual predator that came into it. And instead of uh, when that news came that this person is a sexual predator, instead of dealing with it appropriately, the church just kind of covered it up. And it was so devastating to Eric. And rightly so, right? I mean, the church shouldn't cover up these sort of things. If anything, we should, we as people of truth, as people of wanting to pursue what is right and good, um, they should have dealt with it appropriately. Um, yes, shared the gospel as well, but also not allow the sexual predator to be in the place that he was. And so he was devastated. So by the time he was going to exit high school, he was done with the IFB denomination. And he goes on to say that he was done really with Christianity as a whole. But because of, and I know how, how this could be, sometimes you, you, you might be already kind of changed in your mind, but you, you, know, you have relationships and you don't want to hurt anybody unnecessarily. So he decides to go ahead and go through a one-year Bible. And he ends up at Fresno Church, which was an entirely different type of church than he was used to. Like he was in a more of a, what would be called maybe a fundamentalist church. And Fresno church was this gospel centered, a church that really was uh, serious about creating a culture that was shaped by the gospel. And he's like, wow, this is what I've been looking for my whole Christian life. I wanted just to be in a place where there was no abuse, no legalism, just the gospel of Jesus. And so for two years in, his whole mindset began to change. He, Where he was skeptical, he found himself just revived in the gospel. He began to work at a mission agency. He desired to preach, but he began to see actually the same sort of corruption that he saw in the independent Baptist movement in, in this church as well. And um, this is where I want to pick up on the video. I'm just going to show you a clip 
of uh, Eric's video where he describes kind of going from one context to the next context. And, um, and then he shares with us some of his, some of his thoughts concerning that. So I'm going to go ahead and play that for you. And that was the first piece of my religious journey. Then the place I went to recover from this place, uh, the leadership there, uh, or I shouldn't say leadership, but Josh Ermler, who I considered a spiritual guru, discovered obviously a few months ago that, you know, he was hiring prostitutes and that, uh, you know, they ended up having an open relationship and there was a lot of duplicity. And so I went from one thing I thought was very real to, and it collapsed to another thing I thought was very real and it collapsed to joining a missions organization. Uh, and I should say in the meantime too, the documentary I uh, worked on in Fresno was produced by Austin Gardner, who uh, allegations have come out that he was uh, sexually abusing and physically abusing children and then went and worked for a missions organization. And the, the guy who was running that missions organization was extremely financially abusive, mentally manipulative, um, it, complete lies about so many different things. Uh, you know, left that, had another falling out with someone who I'm very good friends with now, but it was a very horrific period for me. And all of it just hacked away at my faith because, again, the Bible's thing is always judge things by their fruit, judge things by their fruit, judge things by their fruit. And time and time again, I was just seeing fruit that was rotten. The fruit of Christianity just seemed rotten. And then fast forward to starting this show. So um, that's just a little clip. We're going to show a few more clips here, but you can see how um, the thing that really gripped me in this part, and Stephen, I love you to uh, to weigh in on this, is that he went from one circle that had corruption, and um, and he spent some time in that circle, and then he went to another circle, another camp, and um, what he thought was really pure and beautiful and good ended up being just as rotten, and um, he made this statement, and and. And by the way, I mean, again, we don't want to de-emphasize that the corruption there. And one thing that I think that's important to point out is that no matter where you go, if there's people, there's probably going to be corruption. It is not just limited to a particular sect or a particular denomination. You can go to any denomination in any circle and you can find corruption. It's going to be there. Um, and I'm sure Eric would concede with that point. Uh, but one thing that I noticed in his his laying out his his thoughts is that he would say, I went from this circle, saw corruption. I went from this circle and I saw corruption. And he's like, you know, Jesus says, by their fruit, just to know them. And what I kept tasting, the fruit I was tasting of Christianity was just rotten. And it seemed like he's like, OK, this circle's corrupt. This cr circle's corrupt. Therefore, Christianity is rotten. Now, I know he put the word seem there, so I think he's trying to, to play that a little bit softer. But as you get later into the video, he actually just explicitly states, Christianity is rotten because I've had these two bad experiences. Now, Stephen, uh, share with us here, why do you think that that is kind of poor reasoning? Yeah, Though we well, understand the emotional strain that he had. Well, to be fair to Eric in the comments, he said he would actually concede that point. Um he jumped in and said that much and, 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 and just repeating oh, that, awesome. you know, Glad he's here. both groups, every group, all groups have corruption. Um, the same problems that were mentioned that were in the church are true in the atheist world and the skeptic world and the Muslim world and the Mormon world. And that's, that's the reality of our world. The thing is that our expectations are higher in the Christian world. Uh, because we live on a higher ground when it comes to moral ground. Uh, we have every reason in the world not to be that way. Some groups, they don't have a standard. And I think what happens in that situation is we break our own standard because scripture lays it out very quickly. It's abominable, it's despicable, the types of sins that we see covered up. And, and by the way, everything Eric says, I mean, we and some of the people that he had mentioned in the video, we know them. We were friends with some of these people and 
we were as blown away as, as anybody and disappointed beyond belief in, in many of the circumstances. And my thing is, is I'm not going to find a single world out there where um, those problems don't exist. I think the difference is, is that Christianity holds itself to a higher standard so that when we miss the standard that we set for ourselves, there's a, a level of hypocrisy that may not be in some of these other groups. And that makes us look uh, less sincere and rightfully so. And But at the same time, I just want to say, you know, um, and, and I'm sure that um, uh, Eric would say this as well, but not everybody in Fresno Church was that way. Not everybody that's in Fresno Church, because John, you know people in that church. I know people in that church. They're nothing like John Erm, uh, Josh Ermler's uh, way of doing things and what he did and how he and his family uh, affected the church the way they did. Obviously, most of the other Christians were not that way in that church. So to to kind of lump everybody together uh, as if like that whole group is bad fruit. No, there was a bad apple in that good group. And so that's why Paul talked about one little bit of leaven can leaven an entire lump. You can have a good lump of people gospel centered who are truly changed by the gospel, who are living in light of the world of uh, living in light of the gospel in the world that they exist in. And somebody comes in and taints it. That is the the battle of good and evil that takes place in every movement. That is the good and evil that took place in the Old Testament. It's the battle of good and evil that takes place in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus had 12 apostles and one of them was a snake. Uh, one of them was a deceiver. One of them was a liar. One of them put on a show. One of them was fake. And so if the, the, the son of God himself, uh, even willingly knowing that there was a individual amongst his midst that would betray, um, you know, it's going to be in every circle. Paul was betrayed. Paul, by the time he was at the end of his life, sitting in prison, said everybody had forsaken him outside of Luke. And so they experienced those things. That is a part of the humanity that we live in, that even in a good place, there is contamination. And even in a biblical place, even in the presence of the son of God, there's people who are fake. Um, yeah. now, or in, in some cases, I, you know, I don't want to say now I will agree that many of these situations, especially sexual abuse on children, um, prostitution and stuff like that. I, I don't see any biblical way of just saying, oh, they screwed up. Um, people screw up all the time. People commit sin. People even do things that they immediately regret that they know they shouldn't have. But some of the things that Eric was talking about are deep rooted, long term, hidden for a long period of time while also at the same living their life on the side one way, getting in front of an audience and telling them the opposite and live the opposite and do the opposite yeah. and yeah. selling it with the emotional impulse that comes behind their great speaking ability. Guys like Ermler are great speakers and you're conveying what seems to be spiritual sermons, but they're actually intelligent deceptive emotional displays of truth. Yeah. And that's where people really get, sh they struggle because you have everything that Ermler said was right, but the spirit behind it was not, it yeah, wasn't yeah. the spirit of God. It was the spirit of emotionalism and a selling point as good as a salesman would. And so naturally when you see something like that, you go, okay, this is fake. This is counterfeit. They call it the spirit of God, but it's really not. Sure. And so that's kind of, I think some of the situation that, that people go in on that, John. And, and again, I, I feel for Eric on this because you and I have seen it. This is not new. This isn't the first time we've had this conversation It is probably publicly. Yeah. We've had this conversation numerous times about other instances, very similar to these. And to be fair, um, man, if I experienced something that Eric went through, just his first experience just sounds crazy. And then, man, I know I'm a good friend with uh, Josh Ermler and um, man, I was devastated and I wasn't as close to Josh as Eric was. So to, to go from legalism to understanding grace in, in a church context, understanding the gospel, and then later seeing here's grace articulated so well, but actually not embodied here was grace being articulated, but not grace being lived out here. And man, and I know that um, Eric will say that, hey, this was not just an emotional decision, which 
he gives some more reasons. And by the way, Eric, I'm so glad you're jumping on here because even just your comments um, here is very helpful. And you really do look good in purple. Um, as you said before, looking great, man. We're going we're to show another clip of you in a minute. So you get to watch your, watch yourself again, <laughs> but yeah, feel Thanks. free to, um, Eric, if you're still watching, feel free to clarify and, um, jump in. Cause this is really what I was hoping for is that we would even be able to have a conversation and maybe we could jump all on and just kind of flesh things out a bit more. Cause I would honestly love to hear more details of your thoughts and the questions that you have. Well, uh, something, them. Yeah, something to wrestle with too is if um, it should be noted that when there are groups that refuse to call out specific things like uh, cover ups or these, uh, you know, abuse situations, et cetera. Um, just to be clear, we are a group of Christians who would vehemently and others did stand up when things came out and, and made public statements and said, you know what? We do draw a line here. We do stand by what we believe. And so again, let's keep this thing specific. There were specific individuals within a group who committed certain sins, but the, the true genuine believers, in my opinion, that found out about this stood up and did something about it. Now, we can't speak on behalf of the people that didn't in the past. We don't know the situation, but I assure you, uh, and John, I know you do as well, but when these kind of things are brought to our attention, we don't stay silent. We're very public about sure. um, calling things out for what they are. So again, Christianity isn't the problem. There are Christians who are problems and there are people who profess to be Christians who are problems. And I think the more that Christianity calls its own out, the better. Um, I'm yeah. not opposed to calling people out, um, especially when you're talking about grievous sins and despicable cover-ups into the manner of which we're talking about here. I think it does Christianity good for the world to see us call out our own or sure. professed our own. And that, and Paul did this. Paul made mandates uh, and for this very cause that if there are people who call themselves a brother, but are living in sexual sins, that they should be called out. And if need be removed from the congregation in order to protect the sanctity and the unity of the gospel in that local congregation. And uh, we saw that take place in first Corinthians. These are things that, that we believe in. And I think Christianity actually has the best justice system for handling misconducts and injustices in the church. The difference is, is some churches don't want to deal with it or some churches uh, are covering up in addition to what was done. So yeah, we get it. And, and that's why we do believe if you follow the scriptural mandate that the spiritual response where there is where there's rotten fruit, the spiritual people actually call it out and do something about it biblically. I think scripture actually gives us the best mandate because outside of the Christian worldview, if you go into an atheistic worldview or skeptic worldview, there is no justice system to deal with these things outside of, well, in the legal sense you do, but um, there are some things that aren't illegal, but are in, in a sense immoral or frowned upon or looked down. I think the biblical worldview gives a better sense of justice and dealing with it, not just in the human realm, but in the light of the bigger picture on the eternal realm. We serve a God of justice who knows the hearts more than the actions, who knows the deception and the depths of that deception. Mm -hmm. And God has the ability to take that individual and expose things at a greater level than a judge or a jury. And in so even if somebody gets away with something in light of the biblical worldview, there will be an individual, every individual standing before a righteous holy God who will give an account for every action, every thought, every deed. And to me, that brings uh, the biblical worldview into a greater view of justice than one that is without God. So I do think that should be considered in the realm of discussion as well. Sure. Um, Eric, you said in the comments, um, I, I'd say that's relatively reductive. And I'm wondering if you were talking in relation to just your own comments, not being as, you know, fleshing it out in more detail, or if you were saying, um, I didn't know if that was a comment related to saying, I went from this circle corruption, this circle corruption, therefore Christianity is rotten. And um, 
And that was just kind of taking from your words. And so if that is not a fair assessment, I would love for you to like uh, lean into that. I'm going to show another clip of what Eric said. And um, I want to give a little bit more of a, uh, a critique of what he says next. I think this is kind of like at the heart of what he saw and then also what he was feeling and um, um, just a, a bit of a critique. And then also, uh, Eric, again, if you're still on, we'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on that as well. Here, let's see if I can jump over here. Me, it's just gotten to a point where if the Holy Spirit is real and if the gospel is transformative and changes people, then why am I not seeing more transformed people? Um, why am I not seeing more people who claim the gospel uh, acting differently than literally anybody else in the world? And in many cases, acting worse than many people within the, the quote unquote world. And so um, so I just to, to jump on this, I totally feel um, what Eric is saying here. Like I'm a pastor and there's sometimes where I struggle. I'm a pastor in Seattle and I go out and I believe that there's power in the gospel to transform lives. And there's times where I'm questioning like, why isn't more people being transformed by the gospel? I think about people in the the church. I think about why aren't they um, seemingly, I mean, the gospel is being preached and proclaimed and we're talking about it in groups and we're trying to apply it. And there's sometimes the, um, it doesn't seem to be um, fleshed out. And as you pointed out, there are many quote unquote Christians who live a lot in a, and I guess in a, more extreme to use the word rotten way than maybe somebody who would have, you know, no religious affiliation whatsoever. And I've heard people who've left the faith and said, Hey, I found more love and more community in a group of people that were non-religious than I have felt love and community in someone who um, was of professing Christianity or professing faith. And I really feel like the, um, the, struggle with that is real. And I can say that I have also felt that particular strain. Um, but I'm going to let, I know Steve and I were talking about this and um, there's a couple of ways to go about like thinking through this. And again, I would love for you to weigh in Eric, but Stephen, how would you address this contention? Oh, you're muted. I did that on purpose because yeah. of the video. I was actually saying something on the side. All right. So um, I was saying Santi brought a good point as well, too, in the comments um, that, hey, I mean, if um, if Eric actually wanted to uh, respond to this later or later, come on, we'd, we'd love to have a personal discussion with him about it so we don't have to answer everything in the comments. But um, I would say something interesting here to me. I, I've thought about this as well. Um, the statement was, why am I not seeing more transformed people? Now, I think that Eric would admit that his worldview is condensed to his time, location, and perspective. Um, over the ages of history, from the time of the apostles who saw the resurrected Jesus, who testified of the resurrected Jesus, all of them were changed by something. Those apostles took a message and they carried into pagan locations, legalistic Jewish locations, and shared what Christ had said, done, and accomplished, both through his ministry, his teachings, his life, his death, his resurrection. And in doing so, that message changed people. It took people who believed in multiple gods and believing in the one true God. It took people who, as Paul said, such were some of you, things like homosexuals, things like idolaters, people like liars, covetous, all of those things that Paul listed there, such were some of you, their lives were changed. And to survey, to, to have an accurate survey that says, you know, why am I not seeing transformed people? Well, to have an accurate determined uh, I guess, assessment of changed people or transformed people or spirit changed people or gospel changed people, 
that survey has to be bigger than one person's perspective, experience, background, eyes, ears, and uh, ability to perceive in their environment. We would literally have to do a survey starting at the very beginning of the time of the church, its people, its followers, and take testimony after testimony of people who were once in a certain position and the gospel changed them, starting with Paul, who was a Judaizer, who was putting people in prison and killing them. But the gospel message, the person of Christ changed him. And that message that he continued on in churches all the way to us today, there's a, a thread from the time of the apostles to us of testimony of people who have been changed by the gospel. And what we find in the Gospels, what Jesus said from the very beginning, that the seed would land on different ground and that some ground would have a reaction to it that was really quickly and it would spring up. And as Luke's Gospel says, apostatize away or, or fall away. There were some that would it be trodden on and nobody would really care for it. They would not regard it. Uh, some would actually rival their desire to follow Jesus with the desire of the passions of the world. And so what you described to me, Eric, about they're actually worse off than the world. And that's because I would say that they were choked out by their cares of this world and the world choked them out there. They were becoming the very thing that they said they hated or rivaled, but their rival was the problem there of their rival was their heart. Their mouth was saying one thing, but their heart was pulling them in another direction and their desires were rivaled and their evil desires were out choking. If you would, they out choked and out won and out gripped the battle of the desire to do good. Why? Because it wasn't done from a pure heart. And that's why there was only one ground in that parable that produced real fruit. And that's what I think you were looking for. I think that's what you were passionately considering. And you believed you were in an environment that there was real fruit being produced, that there was that hundredfold, as Luke's gospel gives the highest number, that hundredfold fruit that was being produced. And you found out it was a counterfeit. But actually, what it probably wasn't was uh, not the, the environment. It was an individual. And that individual obviously had been choked out. Uh, by something greater and it and it showed and it proved that it wasn't true fruit and that is the beautiful thing about the gospel too is that god uses things to spite people sometimes because i yeah. i don't doubt for a minute that god used some of the things that josh ermler said or others that you've had bad experiences with god uses people despite them sometimes but i would say that when we're talking about this matter of of good fruit or these people being worse than others we should already in, in every case, in every circumstance, go into any environment of Christianity and expect to see the different results, as Jesus said in the parable of the soils, or to see people in the midst like a Judas Iscariot, or to see people like a Demas who forsook Paul. They, they should be expected. Not, we, we shouldn't be surprised. I, and I'm telling you, uh, you know, Eric, I, I've been, I've been in the, the, some of those turmoil places that you've been in. You can ask John Beasley who's sitting on this, but I have had conversations with him that have left me in anger and rage and, and disappointment to a deep rooted level. And I've had to work on this in the sense of, you know what? Um, I don't see everything. I don't know everything, but I do know this. I'm not going to go into an environment and expect everything to go well or everybody to act like a Christian who says they're a Christian because they're not, because there are the different soils. There are different people that play the cards and, 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 and put on a show. And so for that, I don't get disappointed as much. And so dealing with the deep rootedness of struggle, you know, I, I, I understand the difficulty of comprehending because the image bearing nature of God you expected to be seen through a leader. And I just posted about this on Facebook the other day. In fact, I wrote a blog and it's going to be released soon because of scenarios like this. And I told John, I said, I'm just going to write something. I'm tired of it. I couldn't sleep one night. And I had all these ideas in my mind and I wrote them down the next day. And I'm going to be releasing a blog on this soon on the living Jesus confronting dead in churches. Uh, when the living Jesus is confronting a dying church, what does that look like? 
Uh, because I do believe that there is a point where God brings to an end the fakeness, the deadness, the lies, the deception, and he does confront it head on. And what it could be is that you, in the sense of, well, God, or I don't see spiritual people, or I don't see lives being transformed, but what you may have saw what came out with Ermler and these others is God actually exposed something. So the spirit was at work. It may not been, the spirit may not have been at work in the sense of, oh, well, all these people are walking in the spirit and I see completely evidence of that. But what you could have been experiencing in the exposure was God brought to light something in the darkness by his spirit. And to that it is an act and a movement of the spirit in of itself. So I, I believe that when which, we're talking, of, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to just say, which the Bible is just not silent about. Like, I mean, the churches in um, Revelation 2 and 3 had problems. You think of the letters to the Corinthian churches. I mean, he said at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, he says, you're sanctified. You're called to be sanctified. So he's he related to their position in Jesus being sanctified, but also their call to this outworking of their sanctification. But he deals with some pretty crazy, crazy problems. And not that those problems should be normative, but it's, you know, it is a something I'm, I'm actually really thankful that the Bible includes so much by way of problems, problem people, because if even as you go through the Old Testament, the heroes aren't Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. They were all broken people, right? The Hebrew, uh, the, the hero is God using these people who are very broken, but he was still carrying out this this redemptive end. And so you trace all the way through the redemptive story and you, what do you have? It's just broken people. It, yes. Being, being transformed, but still struggling with sin. And I want to, I want to dive a little bit more into that theology. I don't want to take too long, but I want to, I want to share a few things on that, but go ahead, Stephen. Look like you have another Well, thought. I was going to ask you this, John, you've been a pastor. I've been a pastor in two churches. We've pastored together <laughs> um, in two different churches. We've helped start churches um, we train pastors. We spend a lot of time with pastors. I would say that one of the things that we emphasize the most to leaders is their ability to point people to God and to give them an image of God or, or an idea of God by the way you lead, because we are a reflection of God and how we, he is the great shepherd who shepherds his people. And he, called us to be under shepherds to him. So naturally when, when, when pastors or leaders sin, especially publicly, it does in a way take somebody's mindset and imagery of God and taint it. Now, again, that it, we're not saying that the pastor is God and that what he does is a full reflection of God. But naturally, when we look at spiritual leaders in church, they are supposed to be demonstrating the same care and kindness and leadership and alertness and resistance and self-control, all the things we see in the qualifications of elders. And that when somebody is reflecting that, we say that guy is a, a, a perfect example of Christ or that guy is a perfect example, but when they blow it naturally, and John, you, would you agree with this? It naturally does take our level of viewing God into a new direction because now we got to struggle with detaching the guy from God because we did see that reflective quality there. D does that make sense? What do you think? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you, when like it happens in parenting, people develop their view of God through, you know, their father relationship, um, when you're in a church, your your view of God, your view of Christianity can be it's influenced by the leaders that are there. And it, it's very hard to like separate those things. And so where there um, where there is failure in a, a Christian displaying, particularly Christian leaders displaying true Christianity, it always tends to mar. And to use the words of Eric, he talked about Christianity being um um, illusory. Um, he says it was blurred and marred and, um, yeah, like I've, I've, I've been there and there's times where I'm like, it does this exist. I remember coming out to Seattle and, um, 
I remember coming out of kind of deconstructing from independent Baptist movement. And I don't mind sharing this online. I'll just go ahead and share it. But um, I remember just saying that I'm going to plant a church and I'm not going to have Baptists in the name of the church and how I lost a ton of friendships just simply because I was like, yeah, I'm not going to call the church Baptist. And all of a sudden people started just like cutting me off, mistreating me, sending me some of the meanest Hey, I'm telling you, Eric, one of the, some of the meanest emails I've ever received are from Christian pastors. And I, it just blew my mind. And I really struggled. And there were times I just wanted to throw the whole thing in. Um, so I definitely can relate with that. Um, now, Eric clearly has more than just um, this happened, this happened. He made in the comments, yes, okay, these were the scenarios, but it goes a, a lot deeper than that. And, um, uh, yes. Are you bringing it up on the screen? Yeah, I'm bringing one of his statements up that, uh, I don't want to skip over while we're on this point. He says lives are transformed in many denominations and systems. We assign our own labels to explain it. Christians don't have an op monopoly on life change. It's not compelling proof of Christianity Ag again, uh, which goes to show that, yeah, I agree I, with that statement. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say. Actually, I, you might be surprised that we actually agree agree with this, but because Christianity doesn't have a monopoly on changing anybody, God does. Um, Christianity is a product of that, and that's if I can just goes. To that, yeah, yeah. Before go ahead. I forget. No, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Put a pin it in it. Go ahead. It it certainly does not prove that Christianity. Um, is the right religion because we have, you know, hey, look, lives are changed. It must be true. But I think we also should be careful to flip that and say, just because there is people who profess Christianity and they don't have life change doesn't mean that it's not true either. Yeah. And I think that's what we're trying to say. What you're saying that this isn't proof that Christianity is true because there's life change because you could go, people experience life uh, transformation in a, uh, you know, alcohol's unanimous program type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And I actually think I was just talking to Stephen about this. Um, if you study like something like Buddhism, they'll, they'll teach you a lot about meditation, which meditation can be very, very helpful for you. I don't think it's something that was uniquely Buddhist. But I do think that meditation and things like that can be a help to you. So you can find truth and helpful things outside of the Christian faith, but it yep. doesn't necessarily make that religion right or wrong. And I totally agree with that. I guess our contention would be just because you have you're like, well, if the Holy Spirit's real, if the gospel's transformative, why why am I not seeing more of it? Um, I think there's actually plausible reasons why that could be the case without it being dismissive of Christianity. And I think that you probably would agree with that assessment. Um, but we're just, I'm just trying to take the words of what you said and trying to, to give a bit of a critique to it. But if it is quite um, not that, like you said, the full manifesto, then um, well, we'd love to hear more of that. Well, I'm going to get more into these points, but go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, well, the, the point is, is and, and I've said this to you before, John, and, and some people in the apologetics field don't like me for this, but that's fine. Um, all truth is God's truth. I remember not long ago, I got a message from Tom Jump. He asked me how to explain something that um, I think it was, um, I think it was Hinduism or something like that had discovered something before Christians did or a concept before Christians did. And he was like, well, what do you say to that? And I was like, I, that doesn't bother me at all. Like, I mean, just because cr Christians don't have a patent on truth, God does. All truth belongs to God. And Christians aren't the only ones that discover it. And so, John, you and I have had this conversation. We just had it the other day. You just brought it up. Uh, a Buddhist has everything has an element of truth. I, I remember saying one time to a family member of mine, even, even Satanists have truth. And um, they believe things that are true. And, and I just remember the reaction. Be like, whoa, what, what did you, how can you say that? How can you say Satanism is true? It's like, wait, don't Satanists believe in a real living devil, a real living Satan? Well, yeah. Oh, well, isn't it a biblical truth? Like, so they have an element of truth. They, they believe that he was a, a light bearer at one. Well, they still believe he is, but in the sense that Lucifer is a light bearer, but 
and you go through mythology, you have that same teaching. Well, that's exactly what the scripture taught before his fall too. So even in the greatest, most disgusting error, there are elements of truth. It doesn't mean that the person who's performing them or found them or talks about them is the one who owns the truth. It just means that they found it first. For example, many of the discoveries we have, and, and I tell people this time, when I was in church growing up, I heard all the time, well, the Bible has all of the answers to life's questions in it. It's like, well, that's not true. Um, all of life's questions cannot be answered in scripture because scripture isn't exhaustively looking to answer certain things. And then people will look at you and go, well, what are you talking about? How can you say that? God's word does answer everything. How? Uh, and then you ask them, all right, where in the Bible can I find the distance from sun to earth? How, how many, how many miles is it from the earth to the sun? Show me the chapter and verse. The answer is it's not there. Why? Because the Bible doesn't give us all the answers. In fact, what God did is he told man to go and explore and subdue the earth, to go out and explore and experience his creation and find elements of truth. When God created the heavens and the earth, he revealed his divine revelation through scripture, but he also left his truth in the universe, his fingerprints. If God did it, he left his fingerprints in there. And there might be an atheist that discovers something in outer space before a Christian does. It doesn't make it their truth. No more does it make a Christian its truth when they discover it. It's God's truth. The difference between Christianity and most is that there's two elements. One, we're followers of the God who did create things or to give truth. And two, we have the Holy Spirit within us, which is the contention here who guides us into those truths, who gives us the ability to understand those truths that others may not understand. That's the point of contention that we're dealing with here because people who say they have that truth are living in error, intentionally living in error. And that needs to be challenged. And I know that we have friends that disagree, but I believe that if a person is intentionally falling into error, knowing the truth demonstrates they don't have the spirit of truth at all. I'm, I'm not, one of those that just says, oh, well, they made a prayer one time, so they're believers. No, uh, as Eric said, you will know them by their fruit, which is talking about teachers, particularly in context. But greater than that, Eric, First John's very clear. Those who practice righteousness are righteous. And those who practice sin and iniquity and transgression are not righteous. I would take it a step further. The fruit is demonstrated by your practice. And if somebody is practicing unrighteousness, they're not righteous. It's that simple. We're just afraid to draw that line because we don't know the heart. But I love what John says in 1 John. Do not be deceived, brothers. A person who practices righteousness is righteous. Don't be deceived, meaning you, you don't have to be left with questions. So when it comes to Christianity and there's people that profess to be Christians and they practice unrighteousness, they're liars. It's that simple. I know that people don't like that kind of theology. It hurts them, but that's the simplest explanation of scripture that is in those texts. And for me, when I'm looking at situations like this, you look for a practice. What is their practice? Not do they mess up? And, Everybody does. And when you say, what just to clarify, practice? just to clarify for our audience, when you say when they're not practicing righteousness, this idea of practice is a, is this pattern, this consistent it's pattern. Yeah. So obviously a Christian, like in first John one talks about, you know, if, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgives our sin. And then earlier, if we say that we have not sinned or we're not sinning, so on and so forth. So a Christian doesn't get to a place where he's sinless, but right. that, oh, that pattern of sin has been has been interrupted. And uh, so that, that and I want to bring this this comment up here. I just make a quick comment and I want to digress a little bit. I want to kind of digress on theology. And I know Eric's is really sharp in theology, so I'm not trying to teach you something here or just more kind of laying the groundwork for a question. But you said this comment, you can't say that, um, or you cannot say that one cannot leave due to bad things happening in the church in one breath. Then in the next breath, say the good things happening in the church shows the Holy spirit. Well, I, I actually think that that statement, um, just taking it at face value is true. I, I don't disagree with that. Um, just because good things are happening in a church, or any place doesn't necessarily mean that it's the Holy Spirit empowering these people to do it. Though I do think that goodness is a common grace of God. If there's yes. goodness, there's beauty, there's truth. Going back to, you said all truths, God's truth. Stephen made that comment. Well, we ultimately as Christians, we believe that all truth, goodness, and beauty comes from God himself. And so we would still like, 
when we see goodness, even if it's in a non-Christian, uh, you better not disagree with that. Whew, I got out of it, Eric. Very good. Okay. <laughs> but um, but even, even if a non-Christian does something good, we can actually rejoice in that and say, hey, that is God's grace, common grace um, to us. And again, not, not trying to get too nitty gritty with um, particular theology, because I know there can be some disagreements, but yeah. Oh, you heard common grace. Uh-oh. <laughs> this is fun. Man, we need to get you on, Eric, sometime. This would be a really fun discussion. Now, um, a couple of things uh, that I just a theology that I want to lay out, and then I want to kind of tie up some of the other other things that you said. There's some things, too, that I just want to, again, kind of say, hey, these are things that we actually really do agree on as well. But when it comes to theology, this big struggle of I saw this context, I saw corruption. I was in this context, I saw corruption. And that being the ground to really cause you to doubt, is there a true expression of Christianity? I think it's fair, but if we think about it, Stephen kind of gave a historical context for an argument for that. But even theologically, we know that in the church, God tells us that there is going to be, you could say, wheat among the tares. And so you're always going to have people who make professions that don't truly possess that life. So in other words, they look like a Christian, but they haven't been truly regenerated. Well, that's in time, that's going to show itself. And the Bible even expresses that there would be a falling away even in the last days. So the Bible, again, is pretty clear that there's this is going to be something. So if there's a falling away of of the true away from the true gospel, there's going to be the fruit of that in churches. And then if you look at um, um, like when somebody becomes a true Christian, Stephen pointed this out in first John, it says that if any, any person is born of God, he doesn't commit sin or he doesn't practice sin. And so the idea there is, is that, that, that pattern of sin is no longer, it has been interrupted by the seed of God implanted in the believer. They've been brought into union with Jesus and they have been regenerated. There's been this life change. Um, but the Bible teaches us that that gospel that transforms, um, it did transform us fundamentally, but not fully. So there is this progression in working out that salvation. Things in Philippians where it says, it's God which worketh in you both to will and to, do, and to do of his good pleasure. We would describe that. That's grace, God working, giving us the ability and the desire to do what is right. But the verse prior says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So there are occasions where you have people in church who profess to be Christians and who are not. Then you have true Christians who they, they have received the gospel. They've been fundamentally transformed, but they still have the flesh and they're, they are at odds with one another. And I know you know this theology. Um, but if a, um, if a Christian isn't by the Spirit working out their salvation, then what you're going to see from that is also bad fruit. It's the works of the flesh. And that's why in Galatians 5, he tells us, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill us the flesh. So you got people who profess to know Christ in the church that are not truly Christians. You have Christians who are not working out what God has worked in through faith in the Holy Spirit. So like, if that's all true and the Bible tells us that's true, then why would seeing corruption in these places shake you in your faith? So my guess, here's my guess, is that this was something that made Christianity distasteful because you said, I found it at Fresno. And then you're like, no, actually, I didn't. I didn't find it. And there was this disappointment, and there was um, maybe a disenchantment with the ministry and all that was going on there. And it made you a little bit distasteful of Christianity, and and I can see why. But I think probably there's there's a cumulative thing happening here. There's not only the experience, but probably combining that with some intellectual struggle of, uh, you mentioned. Um, you had too many unanswered questions mm -hmm. and um, you didn't name any question in this. So I guess <clears throat> maybe in a, a further video, if you would care to share, or maybe we could talk about it. Would love to talk to you about those questions. Um, and I'll just say the first to admit too, I know Stephen could say this too. 
we have questions too. No. <laughs> and actually, I think it needs to be said, there are no worldviews that have all the answers to all the questions. And I appreciate you saying, man, I just don't know, man. I just don't know. And, um, there's sometimes we would do well as Christians to say the same thing. And I don't think that means we have to let go of the faith because we don't know all the answers. Um, so you, so you're the way I understand it, Eric, you said you, you saw a lack of true Christianity that created the context for the struggle. You had too many unanswered questions. And then the third thing that you mentioned, you said that there were these thought termin uh, terminating cliches. And I really like this part of the video because, man, I could not agree more with you. Um, when you were laying out some cliches, I was like, yes, this is such a problem in the church. Mm -hmm. And I really wish they would stop. Matter of fact, when I'm um, when I'm teaching and preaching, a lot of times I'm thinking it. Um, I know this is not a cliche, but. I try not to use alliteration and I try not to use anything that's like one of those, you know, uh, come on, you're an evangelist once. So you use alliteration. Back in the day, the back in come the day, on. I have reformed, brother. <laughs> <laughs> but um, careful, you get in trouble with that term. Yeah. And for those who are watching, a, um, a thought terminating cliche is a like, kind, of, kind of a commonly used phrase, sometimes passes like a folk wisdom used to quell cognitive dissonance. So, um, this happens all the time in Christianity, like where <laughs> you have a problem with like, here's your life experience. Here's what the Bible says is true about God. And they don't seem to line up. And you may even voice that. And somebody just says, you just need more faith. Or as Eric pointed this out, God works in mysterious ways. And um, there's other types of cliches like this. And, and it is very sickening. I remember when Beth and I went through the struggle we had with our son, William, who was born with uh, Golden Heart Syndrome, and we've had quite a bit of a struggle. I had some hard thoughts towards God and deep struggles. And for people to say, you need more faith, I just wanted to slap them. I mean, uh -huh. seriously, I was like, this is just um, a ridiculous statement. Um, now, Steve, I want you to press into this a little bit, uh, maybe maybe even share some uh, thought terminating cliches that you've heard. Yeah. But I, I just want to maybe if um, Eric is still online here, because I know we've been going for a time and we need, probably need to land the plane here somewhat soon. But um, one thing that I would say, and I've done a little bit of study on this thought terminating cliches with um, I enjoy studying psychology and counseling and things of that. And so I've come across this terminology. And one thing that they've stated in the literature is that a, this thought terminating cliche is not necessarily saying something that's false. Like you mentioned, one of those cliches is just somebody saying God is the judge. The, there's nothing actually wrong with that statement. It's a true statement. However, somebody could misuse that to dismiss something. So for instance, if there's sin in the church, and you wanted to bring that up so it's uh, dealt with appropriately. And somebody says, hey, listen, leave it alone. God is the judge. Well, it's a true statement, but it's misused. And I think that um, this happens all the time. Like somebody is struggling with something. And instead of digging deeper into theology or digging deeper into whatever study, somebody might just kind of shut down the conversation or the study by saying, well, God just works in mysterious ways as if to say, Hey, you don't need to study this anymore. Just, you know, just trust God's got this God's mysterious. This is the way it is. And certainly there's sometimes where we are resolved to, I don't understand this. I'm just going to trust God. But I think sometimes we so quickly shut down the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I find what Eric is saying is very helpful and there needs to be a reform in the church where we don't shut down conversation. When somebody is struggling, we don't just say, hey, rejoice in the Lord and have more faith. I mean, the Bible actually tells us to weep with those who weep. We should sit with people. We should hear those things. And some of these statements, though true, we need to make sure that we're not dismissive or covering up something even by a true statement. So I do think that there's a val validity to what he's saying. Stephen, do you want to elaborate on that? No, I agree. I mean, we've, we've heard it, you know, trust God or, you know, God said he would do this. So just, you know, expect it or, or in, even, even in statements that are true, but the timing of them is so bad. Like 
uh, God is sovereign. Well, yeah, uh, you know, or um, statements of um, all things work together for good. That one's always, you know, Romans 8, 28, you know, what's this Romans 8, 28, everything. Okay. You know, this person just lost their child. Like, I mean, of course, God in his redemptive plan on the biggest scale of life and eternity is going to use everything that happens for his glory and our good. But um, that's probably not what needs to be said for somebody to understand God in that moment, the way that people do it. And, and I think most people are actually well intending when they do it, but the timing of it is just awful usually. So even John good statements are, are often used in a bad time, but you know, I remember um, not long ago, um, you know, just, just to kind of, and I've never publicly talked about this. So this is the first time, you know, I, I'll, I'll be doing that. John knows this more than anybody. A few years ago, um, I was struggling with God big time. Um, the way I was writing was embittered. Uh, in fact, I wrote um, uh, an article and I can't, it's somewhere on the website still. It's how do I, how do I trust God when I don't like him? Uh, or something like that. I can't, it was, I think it was, how do I trust God or how do I follow God when I don't even like him? Something along those lines. And I wrote it from one of the Psalms <laughs> and I remember writing it. Actually, I was writing it uh, while I was sick. I was physically sick and I was angry at the same time. So there was, there was two bad combinations, but most people don't know this, but about four years ago, um, I was actually five years ago, I was pastoring a church in about four, about four years now, my wife at the time had left me. And uh, that was a, a roller coaster ride emotionally in of itself and went through this entire traumatic thing. John was there through quite a bit of it uh, as counselor, friend and uh, advisor, et cetera. Him and his wife, Bethany, were. And during that time of dealing with the losses and the sin and all that went through that process, about two years after all of that, things started hitting a climax. I was doing my PhD work. Uh, life was changing. Circumstances were changing. And the answers didn't come. The Bible verses I'd claimed for two years or the things that I saw scripturally with justice and truth and acknowledge, those things didn't seem to add up in any way, shape, or form. And the more and more I began to trust the word of God, the more angry and embittered I became because the results would actually get worse, not better. And so I would call John, and, and John will tell you this, I would call him multiple times and just vent, just vent. Um, I would probably say things about God that rightly des deserve to be struck by lightning uh, <laughs> just out of frustration. Like um, uh, there are things that I wouldn't want to have repeated back to me. And I wouldn't want to hear a recording myself saying um, I remember frustration, but there was one guy in the whole world that I feel like I could do that with. And that's the guy on the panel with me. I didn't feel secure doing that with anybody else. Um, and I know that multiple times I'd gone to mentors or, or friends or family and wanted to express those feelings. And when I came just a little bit close to sharing my frustration, I was immediately pushed back with the lingo that we're talking about. John never did that with me. I was able to call him and do those things. And I remember, um, even giving God like timelines in my mind, like, Lord, if you don't do something by this time, then I'm just done. Like I'm done. And then, then you're not the God of the Bible that you say you are. And I remember being enraged with looking at scripture, looking at reality and saying, there's no way these two things absolutely line up. What I'm reading in scripture does not connect to the reality of my life. And I remember um, giving God timelines and saying, God, you better do something soon and you need to intervene in a certain way. And I'd come up with all these expectations of God that needed to be done. And um, I remember telling John, like, I'm just I I'm going to go along with it, but I'm not happy. I'm going to serve God, but I'm not happy. I'm going to do the right thing, but I'm not happy. And I'm going to tell God I'm not happy. And I'm going to tell you I'm not happy. I'm going to do the right thing because it's the right thing. I think it's stupid. I think it's dumb. It doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I went on and on. Like, I'm going to do the right thing because that's what the Bible says to do. But I just want you to know, and I want God to know, I'm not happy about it. Because God didn't make sense to me. 
what he was letting happen in my life didn't make sense to me. And some of the relief, the relief on the other side of that was just to throw God out and not believe in him anymore or to just fault him as being inconsistent with his word. To me, there was an overwhelming relief at the thought of letting go of God. But John brought something up to me and it's something that didn't stick the first time or the second time, because you got to tell me things three or four times, but on a good eventually, day. yeah, yeah. On a good day, on a bad day, it's like 10 <laughs> times. But, uh, but, um, John said something to me that I'll, I'll never forget. He said, you know, all right, just say you move on, you become an atheist or you become, you know, the next Bart Ehrman or something like that. And, um, what are you going to do with these problems in light of that worldview? And as I began to examine in my own mind, because I, I, I've i debated some of the world-leading atheists on issues. I've, I've been on stage with Carrier. I've been on stage with Robert Price. I've, I've dealt with issues of, of atheism and had good conversations with these guys behind the, on, behind the scenes. And it's like, what do you do with the problems from that worldview? And one of the things that it dawned on me one day is, oh my goodness, it didn't fix anything. It relieved me to not have God in the equation because the world that I lived in didn't make sense with him in it because he seemed inconsistent from his word life. And it's, and, and, and reconciling all that was happening could not be reconciled in my mind. And so therefore to relieve myself of God and relieve myself of Christianity would be a whole lot easier until you actually consider what's on the other end. Until you have to consider about the worldview you have to deal with the justice problems don't go away. In fact, they heighten. And that's one thing that stuck out to me. Where is the sense of justice when I leave God out of the equation? Now, that's not a reason to believe in God, but me wanting to disregard God wasn't because I didn't believe in him. It's because I didn't like him. And his world was not making sense in my world. His word was not consistent in my world. And therefore, I was ready to just to say the heck with it because it doesn't work. But really, when I look back at those scenes and those phone calls with John, I had no clue what God was already doing behind the scenes in so many ways, answering my questions while I was angrily asking them. Um, and it ended up, honestly, it wasn't like something where God just showed up and said, all right, here, I'm going to answer you now. I followed you. In fact, God was probably six months past my timeline. Um, but when he started answering things, I felt stupid at the end of it because I recognize something that in the end, God does see more than I see. He knows more than I know. And I thought I knew enough to come to a conclusion to accuse him. But at the end of the day, I couldn't because he outsmarted me. Um, he outsmarted my timeline. He outsmarted my attitude. He outsmarted my, my definitions and perspectives. And uh, no, all the problems don't go away. No, all the feelings don't go away. No, all the tears, the hurt, the hurt, the loss, the pain does not go away. But being able to deal with it through the biblical worldview has brought a new meaning to the word redemption that the atheist world could never give. And I've been able to see something in the last really six months after waiting almost five years with the word redemption on it. and. It's something that was beautiful. And John talked about the word beauty and goodness. Those definitions were dead for four and five years. Dead to me. Um, but out of death, God is where God is at his best with the gospel is when he brings life from dead. And God had to make sure something was dead, dead, dead in my life before I could actually see true life and his true work. Because now when I'm looking back, nothing, nothing can explain it. John Beasley didn't rescue me. Marriage counselors didn't rescue me. Other people didn't rescue me. My family didn't rescue me. Money didn't rescue me. Materialism didn't rescue me. A new job didn't rescue me. Apologetics didn't rescue me. Explain International didn't rescue me. When I look at the situation and I look at what's been going on over the last few months, I can't point to an individual because it is unexplainable in the world of humanity. Something happened that nobody saw coming. And that's because God was working that out behind the scenes when I was in the middle of crisis. And so I think what God likes to do, even in bad, tragic situations, is take something dead and make life from it. So that, so that he does prove himself evidentially 
so that he does prove himself that he is working and existing in our universe and doing things despite people, not because of people. And I think the mistake that I almost made and that others make is we're ready to move on before we get to see the most beautiful, majestic work of redemption. And we typically quit right before it happens. And I'm not saying mm. that to like talk you out of anything or say, Hey, my story fits your story. I can't speak for your worldview, but I do know this from a guy who was really angry with God a few years ago and ready to just throw things away to feel better about it. I'm so glad I didn't. I'm glad that was a guy like John Beasley who just sat there and let me vent like a, a jerk and let me say things about God that I probably should be kicked out of the Christian faith for. But at the end of the day, I had a guy who didn't sit there and just one line everything to me and just tell me. And he knew what I always say, Stephen, you already know the verse anyway. I don't need to tell you the verse. I don't need to tell you what God says about this. You already know. He didn't tell me something I already knew. What he did is he let me vent. He let me share my frustration and tried to reason with me from the other end. And in doing so, I was thankful that God allowed a person like that in my life. So we want people to vent. We want people in our environment. We tell our apologists this. We tell our apprentices this. Come to us and tell us anything. You're not going to scare us. We've heard worse and we've said worse. So just come freely and, and vent. And we've created and we hope to continue to create that environment and explain international for our apologists, our apprentices, our pastors that we're working with and training in Kenya and in and, and, and Fiji and in Malaysia and Luxembourg and all the places, Indonesia. And we want our environment to be inviting of questions and even vent sessions that might need to be repented of later because we believe God brings life from the dead. And uh, just went on a so, tangent there, but John sharing yeah. that, uh, maybe that'll yeah. help. No, I, I appreciate you sharing that. And just to be reciprocal and uh, say as well, um, Stephen has been that good friend to me as well. He knows <laughs> that I've we've had quite a journey ourselves and I time would not permit for me to share that this time, but I'd love to share that with, maybe we can do that online. And even Eric, if we have another conversation, I could share some of my journey as well. But Stephen has heard many times where I was, I felt like I was hanging by a thread and I'm, I am thankful for God's grace. So just to kind of bring this full circle and um, kind of um, maybe putting the ball in your court a little bit, Eric, um, we dealt with the emotional struggle of seeing the corruption in church and um, maybe a little bit of the theological like, hey, if there's power in the gospel, why am I not seeing it? And just kind of giving some some reasons why and also kind of saying you probably have seen the power of the gospel, the message of that gospel actually being worked out in someone's life because the more that is fleshed out into every area of life, how you view everything, uh, how you respond to things. I mean, it was pretty remarkable, like just to give another spot, like in Philippians when Paul's in prison and he can have joy and he can write to a church outside of prison and say, hey, you can have this joy too. That's pretty remarkable. What brought that change was a gospel hope, a gospel reality. And where where you don't see that um, is usually where the gospel is being preached, but not truly embraced at the heart level, at the affection level. But I think you would agree with this, even as a, um, I don't know if you would consider yourself an agnostic or where you would be on the spectrum, but regardless, belief in something will actually dictate behavior. What, what you are believing. So if I truly do have an active belief in the gospel, it's going to show that show in the way that I love people, the way I respond. And I think if you looked objectively at the picture that Christianity is supposed to look like, you would say, this is good. This is beautiful. And you see Jesus coming on the scene and you see a religious atmosphere that was very corrupt. And Jesus said some of the harshest words uh, to that crowd. And I think some of what you've done with your your work with the Preacher Boy podcast is just drawing attention. And I think there was, in some ways, very Christ-like in that you were exposing some of these things that really needed to be exposed. Um, but I think we we dealt with the theological and even emotional level with that. And also, we agree with the thought terminating cliches. They need to go. They really <laughs> do need to go. So what are the questions in your mind that are left unanswered? Because I think that's it's this cumulative thing. It's that emotional struggle and seeing the corruption in churches that's caused you to pause questions you don't have answered. 
And then you had some of these cliches that you said just kind of did it in for you. Um, so if we dealt with those things, what are those unanswered questions? We'd love to journey with you on that. And so invite you, we'll, we'll, we'll try to correspond on the side and maybe we could do a video. And I also like, I just think that having more people who are Christian people and who are non-Christian, whatever they are, having conversations would help so many people. So we would like to and invite you to that. And we can have a little, um, seems like you're a, a pretty relaxed person. We're pretty chill. So it'll be a fun time. So and, I just kind of repeat and, and kind of repeat what you were saying earlier, John, uh, and you've said this to me before, it doesn't matter which worldview you go to, no worldview has all the answers. So yeah, Christianity, we have, God gave us the answers for life and godliness, but he didn't tell us everything that would happen in between. And so we don't have all the answers to why things happen and why God let certain things happen, or why things go the way they go, but neither do other religions or other belief systems or the atheists or the skeptics. There will always be questions that are unanswered in every group. Um, but I believe Christianity's worldview has the essentials of who we are, who is God, righteousness, judgment, salvation, redemption, judgment, eternal life, eternal destruction. All of those things are clearly answered in scripture. A lot of the in-betweens are what are not. So we have a destination um, of promise that others do not. But when it comes to any belief system, as you said earlier, John, not everybody, it doesn't matter where you go. Answers are lacking in every group. Every group lacks answers to certain questions. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody that's joined in and the comments have been incredible. I know there are some questions that we didn't have answered uh, here. We've gone a little bit over our time, about 16 minutes over than what we planned, but um, just uh, a great discussion. And um, if there's other videos, we pro I mean, we're not going to try to do every time someone deconverts, we try to do a video on it. But if there is something that um, we want to try to take some of these things and just talk about them because truth is there's probably a whole lot more people that are struggling with their faith or where, where to land. And we just want to show that the Christian faith is reasonable and a lot of objections um, sometimes just need to be worked through. And so we want to take time to do that and explain. So anyways, thank you guys so much. You guys have a great night until next time. God bless, grace, and peace.